Welcome everybody to the first ever GPS clinic by GPS Training. We're live on Facebook as you're quite aware because you're watching us. Um, what we're going to do after the uh, live uh, presentation is we're going to create that into a YouTube film and then we're going to upload it onto YouTube and then we'll embed that recording into our website. So if you've got friends or family or you're going to miss it or you know someone's going to miss it, don't worry because we'll put it on YouTube um, at the weekend to do it. So who have we got this evening for the first ever GPS training clinic? Uh, my, my name is John and I'm one of the uh, directors of Shepherds Walks, which is the parent company of GPS training. I'm, sh I'm joined with Tom from Garmin. Hi, everybody. And Andy is our top tech geek if any listen to our podcast. <laughs> so uh, we've already got some questions off of some people, but we're also going to do some live questions as we do it. So it's the first time we've ever done the GPS training clinic. Uh, so we've had no practice runs in it. We're doing it live for the first time. So please be patient. Uh, it's all kind of new to us. So um, hopefully you'll be patient. And uh, we've already got say, say, some good questions uh, we can work through. A long time th thought, so we're gonna do this GPS uh, clinic quarterly throughout the year, um, as well as our monthly podcast. So hopefully you're already listening to our podcast every month, but this is gonna be in addition to it. And we did debate whether we should be recording it and doing it as a podcast, but we thought we'll do this as a standalone product. So again, if people have seen us uh, record our podcast live, we have a microphone in between us, uh, but today we're just doing it directly to the camera. And in these uh, GPS clinics, we're going to um, cover everything that you want. So anything on outdoor GPS units from support, navigational tips, and right down to the units itself. So if you can see, or you can't see actually just our camera, we've got some units here. So there's some direct questions relating to any units uh, we'll cover that there. So who are ourselves at GPS Train? We're the largest independent retailer of outdoor GPS units and we're the largest nationwide trainer also GPS units. And the great thing about that, we can, on, we can offer honest, impartial advice. So uh, we don't just uh, ask questions and put up with things. We can give honest um, answers to your questions and hopefully we can do this in this live environment uh, this evening. Okay, we've got no live questions, so I'm going to jump straight on to some email questions that we got earlier on in the week when I sent the newsletter. And the first one is Chris Muirhead. So thanks, Chris, for sending in your questions. He has a GPS map 62S and he says he loves it. So that's a good start, isn't it? So thanks, for Chris. When he stops for a break, his GPS keeps on tracking. And what he's getting there is when he puts it into Garmin Base Camp, he's seen a tangle knot of very short movements. So he's got a 62S and he's seen his tangle knot uh, a very small movement. So I'm going to pass that initially on to Andy and then uh, Tom can uh, follow up after that. So Andy, why is this happening with this 62S? The older generation of GPS units, the standard setting that we normally put in in the track recording is that the unit will automatically record as soon as it's started. Right. It's best to leave that on so you don't forget to record where you go. Our little tips that we normally give you on the online training resource um, to cover the track recording is you always reset your trip computer just before you start your walk. Yeah. So where there's older generation units that are turned to record all the time, or the settings to record all the time, we go into the trip computer, and when you're on your trip computer page, you press the menu button and you get the option to reset, and we say reset trip and track. Yes. So that's what you do at the start. Yeah. But what um, Chris has seen is, goes for his walk, you'll see this thin line being left behind him as he walks, that's the track recording. When he stops, they don't have a pause facility on those older units. Right, okay. So what's happened is the satellites in space are seeing you as this teeny little dot on the ground and they're exaggerating your slight movements and you get this little ziggy zaggy line when you stop. Now, you could turn off your unit and just turn it back on again and wait for it to get a yeah. signal and the recording will start again. But what's happened in the new units, I know on Chris's question, he said, would Garmin address this in the future? The new generation units that we sell, so this is likes of the... Oregon 700 and the eTrex touch units, they now do have a function where you can pause your track. So what happens with those new generation units, they prompt you to start the recording and at any time you can swipe up from the bottom of the map page okay. and press stop and then just swipe up again and press start. The units do actually, the newer units have an auto pause function, yeah. but we often find <laughs> with the auto pause, unless you start off at a quick speed, it doesn't always start again. So Unless you're a cyclist, we don't tend to use the auto pause. But on the new generation units, that's the Oregon 700 series, the eTrex Touch, they have addressed that issue, and you do have facilities to manually pause and just simply start it again without the need for turning the unit 
off and then turning it back on again when you're ready mm -hmm. to go. That's brilliant. And I think, Tom, the 62S was the last one not to have that auto force yeah, so feature. In. It was, it... Yeah, everything up uh, going forward from there um, right, has okay. it. Even if you do forget, you can go into base camp afterwards, can't you, and cut out the middle of the track if you wanted to. Um, so if you do find that you have forgotten to, with your, one of your older units, do it, you can go in base camp yeah, afterwards. Yeah, that's good. By base camp planning software that you look at to view the track that you've recorded, that's where Chris is probably seeing those ziggy-zaggy lines. Yeah. You can use editing tools in there to erase those bits out. That's the sort of stuff we show on our training videos on the online training resource. Yeah, that's and if you're using one of the more basic units just for tracking, actually, it doesn't really massively affect the mileage, but it will affect your ascent and descent data yeah. a lot more so if you do you are using it just as a tracking device and the interesting there it shows that actually the satellites we perceive as a fixed object they're not actually fixed are they actually they are moving yeah. that little bit in in, as, in the atmosphere as they go around yeah. um, they're moving a figure of eight right. in space and that's what that zigzag line is it's as the satellites moving a figure of eight and they're picking you your slight movement up and exaggerating so if these guys who are watching us tonight if they get their gps units and going late in the garden this evening and leave it all night they were actually put it into base camp, they actually draw this figure of eight with it for yeah. uh, however long it's been out there for. And the final thing I would probably see on that, where it's more obvious, and we often get a lot of calls where customers are inside and they're maybe near a window, so they're getting a slight satellite lock, yeah. but because the GPS is trying to lock on and it thinks the person's moving because it, it'll see more satellites as they get near the window, less as they come away, you'll always see that really exaggerated. If you're sitting inside with your GPS turned on and you're partially locking on yeah. the satellites, it'll exaggerate that ziggy zag line. That that's when see. you see, when you're inside, it doesn't know when it's struggling to get yeah. it. Because that's often when you even see on your trip computer saying like you're doing three kilometres or two miles and actually you're not moving, it's because it's struggling to get that satellite signal, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So. Brilliant. So that hopefully answers your question, Chris. So the reason is, is 62S doesn't have this uh, option to pause that track, where on the uh, later models it's got an auto pause, which uh, Andy kind of said, rightly said, and I agree with him that we don't over light, but you can physically, physically stop manually, that, manually stop, stop it if you wanted yeah. to, and, and because these satellites keep moving <clears> around in the air. Uh, Okay, next one is a guy called Brian. He's, um, he's, he's, I suppose he's looking to get a new GPS unit for Christmas presents. And he's saying he's struggling to see the difference between the E-Trex Touch 25 and 35. So I'm going to go straight to Tom. What's the main difference between the E-Trex Touch 25 and 35? Other than, I don't know, it's about 100 price, pound <laughs> price difference, but we won't go into price at this point. Um, so there's a couple of differences in the physical feature sets of them. So uh, the first one is in the sensors. So the Touch 25 has the three axis compass. Um, but the 35 has the compass and the barometer as well included in there. Right. Um, you've also got the ability to pair it and plus sensors to the device. Okay. So that could be a speed cadence sensor for a bike. Right. Uh, one of our temperature sensors or a heart rate device. Yes. Um, and the big one is Bluetooth connectivity. Okay. So the Touch 35 has Bluetooth, so you can pair it to your phone and get smart notifications in there. And what are these smart notifications that we get off the phone? Uh, then? Text, phone. Uh, email notifications will all okay. come through onto the device while your phone's tucked away in your rucksack. Brilliant. And do you and does will that damage the battery life on that unit or not really? No, the Bluetooth devices are a low energy device, okay. so they don't draw an awful lot. The, the tip is with the, with the 35, if you've got Bluetooth turned on and you've got nothing connected, turn the Bluetooth yeah. off on the unit while you've yeah. got nothing connected. But you know, they are what they call low energy yeah. devices, so they hardly draw any current mm -hmm. at all. From the unit and we've looked a little bit in the past on newsletters with that wikilock app haven't we which is a wireless way of getting tracks and routes onto it again that would work with the 35 would it not at the moment no you would need to look at something like the oregon 700 okay. to use these new apps so that's a step up from the 35 so okay. the, the 35 the bluetooth and the wi-fi is really for tom's mentioned the accessories and the other function is they've got this garmin connect app that we can use for getting messages on your phone yeah. or syncing where you've walked and yeah. um, so the recording of where you've walked onto the connect app but mm -hmm. the next step up would be looking at something like an oregon 700 if you want those Again, extra wi-fi features alongside. Yeah. it's fantastic so that's hopefully answer your question brian so i can at the moment we're saying loads of 25 so it's one of our christmas offers isn't it so we've got a, we've got a fair bit of money off it's 70 pounds off it is it Andy? i think um at the moment the touch 25 oh, no, it's, it's um the touch um 25 at the moment that one was with the full GB 1 to yeah. 50 mapping, £329 retail. We've got that right down to £249.99 right, okay. on the Touch 25. So we've got a big discount at the moment. Yeah. And we're selling it. Uh, Tom's just uh, come up actually from um, from the northwest of England today with boxes and boxes of GPS mm -hmm. units because we've been selling so many of those Touch 25s. We've been struggling to keep them in mm -hmm. stock. 
Um, so it is a win because for 250 quid, it's a, it's a cracking unit, isn't it? I'll tell you a, a good point to mention about the Touch 25 if you are thinking of looking at it and then you're thinking of some of these extra features that you might get with a 35. To be honest, if you're purely hiking and walking and you're not wanting to add on the cycling accessories and you're not worried about pairing with your phone, it's a great unit. But some customers I've had on in the last couple of weeks have already got another Garmin device, one of the fitness watches. Right. And what they're doing is they're using that fitness watch to pair with the the phone to get messages on the fitness watch and record and sync that data direct and what they're buying the touch 25 for is to have that bigger screen than their watch with yeah. color maps on yeah, in order yeah, and survey yeah. maps so it's a good way if you've already got a garmin watch that pairs with the the garmin app and gets that information about people trying to call you yeah then you don't really need those extra yeah. features of the 35 yeah. so the 25 is then giving you a color screen yeah. with full os mapping for your navigation side yeah. of things yeah. Yeah, that's good. And E-Trex Touch 25, people don't know what we're talking about, is this one. I'm going to hold it up in front of the camera, hope you can see it. E-Trex Touch 25, which is a big seller uh, coming up to Christmas this year. It's a good one. And 35 just got a grey uh, background, isn't it? So it's a grey around the edges, rather. So that's E-Trex Touch 25 and 35. So, Okay, if anybody's got any questions on Facebook, just yeah, type them in. Fresh. And uh, we can... We can... It's a few minutes now. Yeah. No, I think there might be someone there, potentially. Right, okay. Oh, Tom's <laughs> giving me some top tips there. If I do a refresh on my page on Facebook, there might be some questions on there, it might be saying. If not, I'll refresh my page and hopefully some questions <coughs> may come in. Time will tell. Okay, so while we're waiting for that page to refresh, oh, it's refreshing quicker than what we said. So uh, scroll down, see if there's any questions on there. Uh, technology. Technology. <laughs> Super fast broadband. Here we come. We are scroll down. Let's see that is that. Oh, there you are. Fantastic. Lots of questions coming in there. Okay, David. Hi. I can only use a tone B for car road navigation go to. How do I switch on voice navigation in English voice, Emily? Thanks. So um, we're assuming you've got a Montana for that question. Is that yeah. right, Dave? We're assuming that. Over to you, Andy, you're right with that. So he's got a Montana, so he's using a tone beep for car road navigation yeah. go If you're using it in the car, the only way you'll get the speech is if you've either bought the Garmin speech and charging device. It's a cradle that has a speaker built in because the unit doesn't have an internal speaker or if you had a headset plugged into it, you might not have realized on the Montana, it does actually have, it often gets used by motorbikers with a headset. Just get the right side on the USB. Yeah, on the side of your unit, I don't know, I'm gonna hold that up the camera, you may not be able to see it, but we have a little headset socket. So if you haven't got a headset plugged in or you're using it with a Garmin car mount that has the speaker built in, you won't hear any speech commands. Uh, when you're using it in the car. Now I'm assuming when you're using it in the car there is a setting in your unit in setup and routing and you change it to say it's automobile driving and as long as you've got that set up you should get the, the speech come through when you use a headset or the Garmin speaker. So it's just to check with you that you know have you got the Garmin speaker or have you plugged in a headset to try it with a headset. Okay, brilliant. So that hopefully answers your question, David. So it's, yeah, um, hope you take Andy's advice be able to do it. Willie Arnold has just written on Facebook. Always great support, tech news and advice. Cheers, Willie, at the top of the class. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a drink on you tonight when we finish. <laughs> <laughs> He's having Oregon 600, but never resets odometer. It now shows 8,215 kilometers. So I, I kind of half know the answer and I'm not the techie person. So, Andy. I'll answer it then, Tom. Okay, right. If I got this wrong, on your Oregon <clears throat> device, on the actual trip computer, you have a trip log that shows you how far you travel every time you go out on a walk. As long as you remember to reset your trip computer before you walk, which we would do from the the trip computer. You press the three bars at the bottom of the screen, and you go into reset, and you select number one and three, which is reset trip and reset track. But you also have built into the unit, and Tom will correct me if I'm wrong with this, an odometer that continually counts up for the whole life of your GPS unit. And the only way you'll ever be able to reset that is doing something called a hard master reset. Now that will reset all of your unit, sorry, all of the settings in your unit, puts it back to factory default as if you just bought it from Garmin. We do have, if you go onto our 
solutions on our you'll keep me right here john on our website gpstraining.co.uk under training, training support, support you'll go down there's a section there's where a uh, section called solutions now when you go into our it's called fresh desk solutions we do have a solution in there called how do i master reset my oregon 600 if you did want to do that the reason i'm directing you there what we've actually got on that solutions as well as the instructions on how you master reset your unit it links you to our recommended settings to put back in your unit once you've done the master reset the way you do the master reset to be honest is just with your unit turned off you hold in the user button on the side of your unit the unit that sorry the button that you normally use to mark the waypoint so the button below the power button so with your unit turned off you keep that button pressed in below the on off button you hold the on off button in until the unit turns on and you get a message on the screen saying erase data to go that in a nutshell that's what you do but i would go into our solutions and have a look in there and if you do do a master reset that will reset that odometer at the top that you're seeing with the complete mileage for the life of your unit. So I hope yeah. that answers I've that. I've just popped that on the uh, feed at the uh, bottom of the Facebook page. So it's uh, what we call a training support portal, GPS training support portal. It has all our standard answers. So if you email us, this is where we get our standard answers from. And again, in there, there's a search box that you can just put in back to your recess. Yeah. And that will there is that actually thing. two separate, um, so you've got two separate odometers within the device, haven't you? So you've got yeah. your trip odometer and the full life of the, of the unit. Yeah. Um, so you can replace the odometer data field on the trip computer with the trip odometer one which would then remove that the need to you wouldn't see that data anymore would you it'd be hidden away in the background yeah that's a, I'm, what tom's saying there is yeah you, you, on the older units i'm looking at a new oregon 700 in front of us and the standard data box on the trip computer is actually called trip odometer so that does get reset every time so you know you can if you touch on any of your data boxes and hold them in you will get an option to change those data boxes to something along the lines of trip odometer rather than having the complete odometer that does the the life of your unit um, but your master reset would get rid of that as tom said if you want to change that data box search through the options on the data boxes and what i'll do now just before we finish this one i'll just um give you an idea what to look for on the data boxes so if on your data boxes on the trip computer if you were to hold in say the one at the moment that says odometer what you can do if you select i'm just going to find it here yeah if you select trip data so you hold in one of the data boxes that you want to change select the option trip data and then if you scroll down you will see a new odometer that says trip odometer and that one will reset every time you reset your trip computer before you do a walk yeah Fantastic. So that's hopefully answered that question there. So that's very much appreciated. I'm just going to jump. There's a few coming online, but I'll keep refreshing um, as we do that. So I also have just put uh, the link in. OK. Um, ba -ba -ba -bom. Colin saying watching, enjoying. He's having to go for his tea. Would it be a bit of watch later? Yeah, it'll be there to the end of time on uh, <laughs> on YouTube. And also we get archived on Facebook when we've uh, been. And actually Hans is watching us, I think, from the Netherlands, is thinking about doing something similar in the Netherlands. So, uh, yeah, you can see how not to do things in the <laughs> from that, can't you? So, I'm going to jump to another of the Egwene questions I got on Tuesday after sending out the quick newsletters. This is from Ben Meller, it is. Ben Meller, yeah. So, he's got an Oregon 700. Um, he would like to, it's nice to know if we can orientate the units so that the map is set. As you turn around, the triangle moves accordingly. Um, so that's the first part of his question. So that's, I think, orientation of the map. Now, this is actually something we've just been working on this week, ready for tomorrow's newsletter. Yeah, isn't our it? top tip in tomorrow's newsletter, we've got a link to a video. If you've signed up to our online training resource that you get for free when you buy a unit from us, we've got a video showing you how you change the map orientation on all of the GPSs yeah. that we sell. So to answer your question, Ben on the Oregon 700 and orientation. Nice simple way to do it. When you're on the map page of your Oregon 700 GPS device, if you swipe up from the bottom of the screen, you'll see in the bottom right corner three white bars on the bottom of the screen. Whenever you see the three white bars, that means you're going into setup for the screen that you're on, and you get the option of setup map. And when you touch on setup map, hopefully it'll be obvious the bit you're looking for. It's titled orientation which is what you want to do you want to orientate the map in a certain way and when you touch on orientation the two choices you want to look at are either north up or track up 
Now we normally recommend track up. So as long as you've got it set as track up, what should be happening on your unit when you're outside and you've got a satellite signal, the top of the map page will always be pointing the way you're heading. And as you turn the GPS device, the map page will turn with you and the blue triangle cursor, which is your position indicator, will turn as well to the way you're heading as you walk. So that's in track up. What you'll also see when you're in track up on the map page, you do actually have a little white north arrow at the top left of the map page, always showing you where north up. The other option is then if you'd prefer the map to be in north up, so you select north up, hopefully it'll tell you north up, It's the map's always going to be in north up, you'll suddenly see that north up arrow will disappear from the top left of the screen. And what will happen is as you walk, the map page will always show north up at the top, but the blue triangle, that will then point the way you're heading yeah. as you walk. So that's the two ways we normally use it. To be honest, we prefer track up so that as you move, as you turn your body, the map turns with you and the blue pointer turns with you as well. Yeah, so yeah, I think the the, you know, the difference is with track up, the, the map moves, but the blue icon stays stays relatively still. Whereas with north up, the map stays still and you move around and you on the, move map, around, on yeah. the map. It's, it's whichever way your uh, brain or <laughs> yeah. deals with the map in front of you. But that's in. Uh, we uh, talked about a bit on the online rooms. But I, I just edited these videos yesterday. That's why it's fresh in my mind. So again, it's in tomorrow's newsletter. But if you go to our online resource, log in, and then select Garmin units. There's Garmin top tips down the bottom, and actually you'll see there's one for. I think we do Every a 30x 664 s Oregon 7, 700 and Montana as well. So there's videos, step by step videos. So if you log into there, you'll see the videos that we just did yesterday. So that will hopefully answer that question. So I've done the first part. There's quite a few questions coming, so I'm going to leave the second half of Ben's question. There, so I hope that's uh, helped you out a little bit. Next one is right down Tom's line here. You see, so I've just started trail running. What GPS would you recommend for quick viewing while running? Now I say that because Tom does a fair bit of running. So uh, and um, so yeah, I'm interested to hear your, your views on yeah, what you so, should be using, Tom. Um, our kind of great product for trail running at the moment is the Phoenix Five series. Um, so there's two models available, uh, the Phoenix 5 or the 5X. Yeah. Um, now the big difference between the two is the 5X shows you mapping while you're running, which is great for a trail runner because you can have a quick glance at the map yeah. and see which uh, whether yeah. the path is the right way to go, which one you want. Um, but it's all based on your wrist, so you're not carrying a unit round, you've not got the extra weight of a unit, it's all on your wrist. But with the Phoenix as well, you get all your added uh, running features that you don't get with a, with a handheld as well. So right. you get all your running data all built into there as well. Have you got one on your wrist or not? I've got a Phoenix 5 on my wrist. Oh, right, not 5X on your <laughs> wrist. We, we stock the 5X, which has the full European Topo Active yeah. mapping on, so it'll look the same as... Yeah, very similar to uh, to this. Um, you've got the heart rate sensor on the back as well, yeah. heart rate off your wrist. Right, into there. fantastic. I've sadly just got the 3 there, so... Uh, and, and there was no force, this is a generation... Yeah, I've, got, I've got an old Vivo Active, so <laughs> I'm the poor man with the watch. But... So that's a uh, going. So a Phoenix 5 or 5X, if you've yeah, got Yeah, depending if you want mapping or not. We also, looking at a unit, we, we often get a few trail runs who are buying the touch, don't we, Andy, with a yeah. rucksack tether. I mean, if you're not wanting them. a wrist device and you wanted to save a bit of money, I mean, I love, I mean, I agree with Tom totally that the wrist device is great for the runners. We get great feedback from the runners, the trail runners using the watch. But when you look at the E-Trex touch we've got, with it being quite a small, compact, lightweight unit, we sell an accessory that goes with the E-Trex touch unit. That's a backpack tether. And a lot of the trail runners I talk to, they, they um, run with a very small backpack, even if it's a water pack mm -hmm. on the back. So with a backpack tether, which attaches to the front strap of your rucksack, you can have the little E-Trex touch there and just pull it off when you need it. And of course, the E-Trex touch has got a slightly bigger screen with the Ordnance Survey map. So I would look at the E-Trex touch more for your navigation, seeing yourself on a map, getting the grid reference off, but more for navigation because you've got that bigger screen with the Ordnance Survey map. In, and Tom's idea of looking at the Phoenix 5X watch is all that extra fitness data, the heart rate when you're running and of course with the 5X you can still have mapping yeah. on the screen. Yeah I watch. think that uh, kind of adventure trail runner, that person who's going you know, right into the back and beyond, the touch is perfect for, for, for that and you know if you do want extra running data as well you can you know get go for one of the bottom end forerunners as well that'll still give you your, 
your running deck running watches, watches, yeah. yeah. Running watches. And just jumping back to the Phoenix, we can plug them in and plan routes on the base camp. Yeah, can we? exactly the same. Yeah, as you do so it works handheld, works how it would with one of our with handhelds. So if you've got uh, somebody's giving you a GPX file of a, a race, you can just import that onto it and yeah, follow it like you would normal navigation. And what kind of if we a lot of these trail runners are doing you know twelve hours runs, how long would the battery life when we're using it to navigate with the so, GPS? So um, a Phoenix Five has got about twenty four hours fully okay. working, but we've then got an ultra mode which turns down the track log data, Okay. Um, but you'll get up to 60 hours with the device, so right. perfect for these big ultras that are going on out Fantastic. there. Fantastic, some battery life, yeah, if you're running for I know, we were running for 60 <laughs> hours myself. <laughs> so, that's brilliant, that's, thank you. I hope that's answered your question about that, that's brilliant. I'm just going to jump now onto something we've actually covered, Simon sent this in uh, as a question, it's something we've actually covered in the uh, podcast oh, we've actually covered it a few times the podcast which is um he's got an oregon 750 he's loving it he bought it from ourselves thanks very much for simon so much very much appreciate it he's bought it one to fifty thousand he's saying what options are available for one twenty five thousand i've been maybe thinking of a christmas present for his wife to himself yeah. so oregon 750 most people buy it with one to fifty thousand what options are available andy for for, for simon? three options i'll start with the the lower price one first so you bought the unit Simon with the full 1 to 50 Land Ranger maps, which are still great OS maps, but you're needing maybe some extra detail. I'll give you a scenario where you're not looking for 1 to 25 mapping for the whole country, but you've maybe got some areas specifically where you do a lot of walking, hiking in, mountain biking. Um, my my exact my genuine example for myself, um, we live in Northumberland where GPS training is based. I've bought something called a Bird's Eye Select voucher, which we sell in the store here, 1999. And with that bird's eye select voucher, what I did with my own unit, I downloaded all of the Northumberland National Park using this voucher. So this one voucher for £19.99 allows you using Basecamp software and the Garmin free planning software. And along with the videos and guides we give you, you can draw around an area that you want to download of 1 to 25 mapping. Right. I'm just using Northumberland National Park as an example. Lake District National Park, that's the sort of size mm -hmm. you get. That's 3,000 square kilometres and then you put that mapping on the memory of your unit. So if Simon, you just had a couple of areas you were maybe interested in, it could be a couple of national parks, that's the cheaper way to do it. The next way up to do it is we have two map cards available on our website that cover the whole of Great Britain with one to 25 mapping. You still get one to 50 on those map mm -hmm. cards. We have an older map card called the premium map card for 275 pounds. And we have the latest one to 25 map card on our website called Topo Pro for £350. Right. If you go on our website and have a look at those map cards, when you go on the Topo Pro mapping, you'll see the new feature that you get for that extra £75. It allows routable data in the national parks where you can mm. get it to snap onto footpaths. Right. So there's three ways, <laughs> £20 for vouchers, and the two lots of map cards that we've got at 275 and 349. And with that bird's eye mapping or the bird's eye download, we put on an internal memory, a memory on the unit, do we? we? Normally, most of the units tend to have enough memory for it to go on the internal storage. When you're looking at the older E-Trex 20s, 30s, you tend to put it on a blank micro SD card. Right. When you're looking at the newer units, like so the Oregon 700s, the Montanas, Map 64S, and even on the E-Trex touches, there's enough space on there to put a few, you know, a good few vouchers on. Most mm. people doing it that way will be buying maybe two or three vouchers maximum to do a few different areas in the country that they want that one to 25 map in for. That's brilliant. So those are the three options really for that 125,000 map. And you said it's 20 pounds to 349 pounds, isn't yeah. it? And when you talk about those map cards, we always bundle them with the units as well. So you can buy them separate. But if you're buying a new unit, it's cheaper to buy it bundled with 125,000 at the time of purchase, if that's what you want. Yeah, if you're to one do. in the whole country, you're better off looking at the bundles we do with the one to 25 maps that cover the whole country. That's so hopefully answers Simon's question. That's pretty good. Okay, I'm going to jump on to Roger's uh, question. Roger Durant. Um, he's, got, he's been on one of our courses in the Lake District. So thank you for coming on that, Roger. Uh, he says, Ben, he says, his cursor seems to end up at the bottom of the screen. He's got a 64S, um, the GPS map 64S, and the cursor seems to end up at the bottom of the screen. He says, it doesn't make any difference whether I have the orientation north or track up. Uh, I find I can correct this by going to the satellite page and then back to the page, uh, the map page, sorry. But I have to do this every time I check the GPS. So it sounds like I kind of think I know what he's doing there. I think he's... he's, he's um, what what yeah. I think you're doing, Roger, and then the other guys may put some input <laughs> in. When you first go to the map page of your Map 64S GPS device and you go outside and you get a satellite signal, you should have the blue position triangle indicator at the bottom third of the screen. It always stays there. You can't move where that is. 
as you walk, the map moves underneath you. What I think you might be doing, if you use the up, down, left, right arrows on your keypad of the 64S to move the map either further ahead to the left or right, um, which moves the map, you can potentially make your blue triangle disappear. But to be honest, when you do that, the map will not move anymore. So I think what you're doing by just coming off that page and going back, you're resetting it, but there is a quicker way to do it. So the tip is what you should always see on the map page of the 64S, your blue triangle, bottom third, and if you haven't, if you move the cursor, you actually get a box appear at the top of the map page, which is basically telling you information about where you've moved the cursor to. So if you're seeing a small box at the top of your map page with information and with distance and maybe a bearing, it probably means you've moved the cursor and your map will now not move. The way to put it back and put the blue triangle back to the bottom third is to press the quit button on your unit. So I have a feeling that's all you're doing, Roger. You've, you've accidentally nudged the up, down, left, right arrows, or you've on purposely done that to move the map and you forgot to press the quit button to take the map back to where you are and then the map will happily move underneath the blue cursor. So hopefully that'll answer your question there, yeah, Roger. That's the, that's the, Do you think that's what that's the, the solution I'm getting yeah. a good nod from the guys, yeah. so I think I'll uh, hopefully answer that answer. correctly for you, Roger. Okay. Uh, Neil's also got an Oregon 750, or oh, Oregon 750, he's after 64S uh, before. Oregon 750, he's got a gone battery pack, uh, which is not very good. So uh, he says, is there any advice in making it last longer or any other alternatives? I suppose he's looking at battery life, so preserving that battery, but then some options other than the Garmin battery pack, Andy, isn't it? I mean, on all units we sell, they all have backlights. So if you're looking at the Oregon 700 series, on that unit, when you swipe down from the bottom of any of the screens, when you go into any of the screens on the Oregon 700 750, you see a brightness bar with a minus and plus. I often find on courses, customers have got that brightness set right to the highest level. Now, when you're inside a building, sometimes you do need to put that brightness up a bit. Um, but when you're out on a nice sunny day, you don't need that brightness up full. So on the Oregon 700 750, swipe down from the bottom of the screen, put the brightness bar down to sort of no normally I would have it outside no more than three quarters of the way across. That's the first thing you can do to save battery. Another feature that we quite like on the Oregon 700 to save battery and some of the other units have this is a function called battery save. So on your 700 unit whatever profile you're using so if you're on the hike profile if you touch the three white bars on the home page of the hike profile you can you go straight to setup and if you go into display there's an option there where how long you have the backlight stay on for. Uh -huh. So we would normally say reduce that backlight time to be really no more than 30 seconds. That will help. But there's also an option called um, battery save. And if you turn battery save on, what actually happens with your Oregon 700 750, whatever time you set for backlight, so say it was 30 seconds, your screen will go off after 30 seconds saving battery, but your unit's still actually on in the background recording. And you simply touch the power button once to bring the screen back on. So that's mm -hmm. a couple of tips to do with saving battery. Do you want me to talk about batteries that yeah, we recommend? Batteries, well, because mm. we have this thing where, don't say this the wrong way, Tom, that a Garmin battery pack is not the greatest battery pack in the world. Is it? We tried to get Tom yeah. actually, I think it was two years ago, we did, We have a, what we call quarter four approach, which we're in now. I said, Tom said, why can't we give some good quality rechargeable batteries yeah. with this? He went, well, I don't think that's going to go down too well, rather than after the Garmin rechargeable battery pack. So what we would recommend is some good quality rechargeable batteries. Yeah. And there's a couple that we, we've mm -hmm. started dealing so with. When you look, the Garmin battery pack itself is 2000 mAh. That's how you measure the capacity of the battery. So they're AA batteries, but they're 2000 mAh. We tend to recommend that you use a minimum of 2300 mAh or higher. The best batteries that we've come across, and this is from you guys out there, customers, coming back to us and saying this is the batteries you want to buy guys this is the batteries you mm -hmm. want to use is a battery made by Panasonic called Eneloop, Eneloop Pro and um, it was a battery that Sanyo had out originally then when Panasonic took over Sanyo in 2009 they've developed the battery even further and the ones we recommend are called Eneloop Pro in that 2500 capacity wow. but they work much better in colder temperatures this technology of the Eneloop batteries is designed to work in up to minus 20 right so the, the traditional rechargeable battery, so like the Garmin pack or other makes, you know, you can lose that yeah. um, charge when they're in low yeah, yeah. temperature. So we found the Eneloop Pro batteries work really well. That's our top end charger. We sell them in the shop under mm -hmm. um, power and batteries. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The other one we found, which is a good cost effective charger, which keeps your cost down a bit. We have an Energizer 
one hour charger. Yeah. Th this used to come out top in the witch reports for best rechargeable battery mm -hmm. and batteries. These ones are slightly lower than the Eneloop capacity, that 2300. Mm -hmm. It's a one hour charger. And again, we find they work really well. And with both these chargers, you get four batteries, so yeah. you've always got the spare set. We find they perform better than the, the Garmin. I know I use those Energize because like a one hour charge, you can't go wrong. Now I get up in the morning, I can plug it in, I'm going for a day, I'm having breakfast, get my bag sourced, then I've got four batteries, two in my unit, two just in case. I've kind of got no 16, 20 hours of battery life there. And I can somebody will play with my GPS unit when I'm where I'm walking. So yeah. I get, and I know from feedback we've had, those Eneloop ones are, you know, we, well, we struggled to get them. We initially struggled to get them because we wanted them and yeah. people were telling us how great they were, weren't they? So that's, I think that's a better option. And when you look at the Energizer, it's just £29.99. The Garmin rechargeable battery pack is £19.99. So spend an extra tenner, you've got twice as many batteries and yeah. they perform a little bit better as well. So hopefully that answers your question, uh, Neil, about the Oregon 750. I'm going to jump to a question live on Facebook. It is from Phil Clark. He says, I can't use Garmin, I can't use Basecam, Garmin Basecam, because my computer still uses Windows Vista. Is there an option besides upgrading the computer? Plan routes on your unit. Yeah. No, to be honest, um, Windows Vista, Phil, if you look at Garmin's spec for the Basecam software, as long as your Vista has been updated to the very latest <coughs> updates, it should be working fine. It is, it is at the very, when Garmin tell you what Basecamp will work on, Vista was the very last software that it should potentially work on. So it might just be that. Yeah. And I don't mean updating your Vista to Windows 10. I mean, just making sure you've got all the latest net framework updates yeah. within your Vista. Other than that, if you do search on the internet, Garmin, um, the terminology now, Phil, you've got me. There's an old legacy, Garmin legacy. Yeah. legacy Garmin Legacy Windows software, you'll get a very old, Garmin have an option of a very old um, version of the Basecamp. And actually when you, if you search for just Basecamp software for Windows on your browser, when you actually get the link for the latest software, which top of my head's version 10.6.2, it should have somewhere in there that if you're using, now it's meant for like XP and much older machines, I think it has a link there to download this legacy version. So you still should be able to download that legacy version. But what I would try first is make sure your Vista's got all the latest Vista updates that were available for Microsoft, then you should actually still be able to run that latest version. I see Hans, uh, well done Hans, has put the uh, link on the Facebook there, the legacy on... on oh, the, thank you Hans. You should be sat in here. <laughs> <laughs> do with you here. Um, <laughs> so Hans has put the link up to the legacy there, so thanks for that. So again, so that'll if, work you, on XP, yeah. if, you, can, if yeah. you can download, that will, that will work well. Neil, good evening. I bought an Oregon 7 just uh, over a year ago and I promised it was going to be fully compatible with a new Glonass. jumps off my brain, the Glue Glonass. I don't think you mean, uh, not the Glonass, because the Glonass are the land based stations, isn't it? He's thinking no, no, Galileo. Russian, Russian, the Russian yeah. satellite. I think, I think you mean the Galileo. I think that's what he's thinking there. The Galileo, which is the European satellite. Yeah. So it's just jumped off the page there. Um, he's asking, well, at the time we thought it was going to be compatible. Um, what's happened along those lines? So again, he bought an Oregon 600. He thinks think it was going to be compatible with the Galileo, um, but that's not the case. Why is that, Tom? Is it, it's um, to do with um, the understanding uh, when the systems come live, it's only just come live really in the last year, really, yeah. Yeah. and the Galileo systems really started kicking in. Um, the, the, um, whether the frequency was going to be close enough to the current antennas within the device or whether a secondary antenna was needed, and it's actually that we need to put a secondary antenna in the device to make it work. So it's not something we can update as a piece of software. Yeah. It's a physical hardware change that's having to be rolled out. Okay, so as the units go through their next stage. Next cycle. Gorman didn't it. find this out until the no, yeah, <laughs> system was delayed so much. Yeah, um, it, was, it was so far behind and there's been so many changes to it and tweaks mm -hmm. to it and updates mm -hmm. to it. Um, I mean, I mean, to be honest, we get a lot of questions about is Galileo really going to improve things? Now, it will give you a little bit more accuracy. I'm pretty sure when the Galileo is all fully live. Yeah. But what you've got to look at on a Garmin, something like the Oregon 700, which has GPS, the American satellites, GLONASS, the Russian satellite, picks up the LAN-based WAS and EGNOS. And the Oregon also has this new function that every time you update the software in it, it preempts, it puts some data in the unit to preempt where the satellites are. We're finding the accuracy of the Oregon is down to last, the last three meters anyway. So to get something that's a little handheld device that's down to three meters, 
personally, I don't know if we need anything that's mm. going to be any less than that unless we're using it as a surveyor as a bit of equipment to bore a hole or something in it, yeah, you yeah. know, like a drill hole or something that needs to be a bit more precise. And you think about the, you know, the geocaches and this kind of thing, they know they're using Garmin GPS units because actually, the, it's, it's, well, the Oregon 700 range is so friendly for geocaching, that live geocaching. And those guys are going finding, you know, micro caches, aren't they? You know, living yeah. like tiny things in trees and so that's the accuracy that you're yeah. getting with the army. I mean, the, the other thing is being that because Galileo is so new, it hasn't got the backup systems that, that GPS has. It hasn't got the WAS Egnos system recalibrating it, you know, the ground based stations. So even though, yes, it is another set of satellites to look for, so it might help with that initial time to first fix yeah. or if you're really struggling. But there's so many satellites out there now with the American and Russian system yeah. that it's unless we're really difficult, certain situation, I don't think it's going to make. It's quite funny that, Neil, because actually, uh, just when you're talking about, we, you know, we do webinars every week. So I sit every every Tuesday or Wednesday night doing a webinar. And my third presentation, I keep forgetting to change because I keep saying that the uh, the Galileo will, will be coming on later on this year on my on my camera. So every week I sit there, get to that slide, and then I, I explain exactly what we just explained there. So uh, hopefully that's, that's answered your question. So I don't think there'll be any adverse um, uh, adverse effects from that. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll keep you updated by your newsletters and things as that happens. So we'll jump to an email that Mark Hughes sent. It's quite a, um, an open question, really. So it's, it's quite a nice discussion, really. Mark Hughes says, do you have any advice on tablets or laptops with GPS <coughs> mapping? So tablets, is there nothing really relating to your Garmin GPS unit currently? You can't, there's no Garmin base, camp. they used to have a base camp app, didn't we, um, years ago, but that, 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 that kind of got defunct, didn't it? Yeah. So there's no app except the Connect app is the really yeah. on a tablet. So it's human mark, um, obviously the discussion, like, where, where, you know, it's Garmin GPS as we sell, the SAP map, memory map. When we're looking at tablets um, for software, with regards to those GPSs that we sell, there's no planning software that you can put on a tablet that you can then send those routes to your handheld designated yeah. GPS device. There is an app called the Garmin Connect app that we keep talking about that will work on a tablet and that's so you can sync data from the likes of the Oregon or the Atrex Touch, but you can't do any route planning. And that Connect app is both Android and uh, iPhone. So on a phone it can go Android or iPhone or right. on a tablet okay. it'll go on a tablet. Um, regarding laptops, with the, if we look at the Garmin range of GPSs that we sell, all of the, the handheld range of Garmin GPSs we sell, most of the ones we sell, if not all of them, will come with some sort of mapping. The most popular bundles that we sell in the Garmin range come with either OS 1 to 50 or Onan Survey 1 to 25 maps. So the way that when you're talking about a laptop, any laptop that you've got that's ideally Windows 7 or newer, or if you're using a Mac, operating system 10.10 .10 or newer, you can put Garmin's free base camp planning software on that computer and a sp you, you need a handheld device to go with it and as soon as you plug in one of the Garmin handheld devices to that computer with the free software, any maps you've bought with your GPS will appear on that laptop. Yeah. Now the laptops don't have to be that high a spec. The best place to find that if you go on Garmin, um, search for Garmin base camp software, if it's a Garmin GPS you're using, when you see the option to download it, it tells you what spec the laptop has to be. And it doesn't have to be that higher spec just to run the base camp yeah. software. So yeah, the reality is we can do it on any laptop, can't we? Any, any laptop, well, most spec, I mean, because I say we buy uh, quite basic laptops for our training course mm -hmm. and things. We can just plug our GPS in with Garmin Base Camp and we get our maps there. Can we print off those maps, Andy, from our GPS once we've planned our route? Yeah, on the Garmin Basecam software, you do have an option to print, so you can print off an right. overview of your route that you've just planned, so you've got a paper copy. Um, I meant to mention, sorry, obviously we're talking about Garmin, yeah, we also sell the SatMap GPS uh -huh. units. If you've got a SatMap GPS unit, their planning software is an online software that again, you wouldn't ac the reason you wouldn't access from a tablet is that you've got no way of sending it to the unit. Yeah. It needs a USB connection, so again, on a on a computer you use the SatMap Expedition software which the problem at the moment is it really only works on a Internet Explorer browser but I think there's things going to be launched soon from SatMap that will be a new planning software that as well as working on many different computer platforms we may see a tablet version but we're just waiting to hear a bit more news on that. That's fantastic so that hopefully answers uh, Mark Hughes's question on that. Okay, Neil says, thanks, Mr. Garmin. Hey, you're Mr. Garmin. I have answered that question. Okay, Richard, um, he doesn't say what GPS unit he got. Uh, loves our podcast. Thanks, Richard, and uh, keep listening to our podcast. 
He said he especially likes Andy's top tips on the podcast, uh, which I know go down quite well. So he says, have you got any top tips to bring to this environment, which is our live uh, GPS clinic? So have you got any top tips with doing Garmin and sat up or off, off the top of your head or not? And you know, <laughs> no, you know? um, <clears throat> I'll do a sat map tip first. Um, it's along the lines of something we've already been asked tonight, so you've given me a clue of what to ask, but it is quite a popular thing that happens there. Uh, on any of the SatMap units, so whether it be the Active 20, the new one, the Active 10 or the Active 12, you've got the map page up, you see yourself moving across the map. What can happen if you accidentally nudge the joystick or the joypad on the new Active 20, your map, instead of saying GPS map at the top, will say planning because you've moved the joystick. Your map will now not move as you walk. I get so many calls from customers saying, sometimes when they're out and about in the field, and they'll ring me and say, Andy, I'm out with my GPS and I think there's something wrong. I think it's got no satellite signal because the map's not moving. And what's happened is they've moved the cursor on their Active 20 by using the joystick uh -huh. or the Active 12 or Active 10. The map will then stay stationary until you press the button directly to the left of the joystick. And that takes it back to the GPS map. It's the same on a similar thing on a Garmin unit. We touched on it earlier about the gentleman who asked about his cursor not moving on, on, on the GPS. All of the Garmin units um, on the touchscreen units, you can move your finger across the screen, move the map to a different location. Now, as soon as you do that, the map will then stay stationary. And what you'll normally see on a Garmin touchscreen unit, where you should see a little white cross in the bottom left of the map page, you now see a little curly back arrow. So if you're seeing a little curly back arrow in the bottom left of your map page, on a Garmin touchscreen GPS, it means you've moved the map and it will stay stationary until you touch that little curly back arrow on the bottom left of the touch screen. On the push button Garmin units, if you happen to move the joystick or, you know, like on the Etrex 30 or on the map 64, it's just a case if you think the map's not moving because you've done that and you've moved it further ahead, you just press the quick button on either of the push button units on the, on the Garmin range and that'll take the map back to where you are. So that was off the cuff there. Off you the cuff, top tips pressure. there. And I hope you found that okay. It's what we live for, isn't it? <laughs> okay, Robin Bamba. Uh, Robin, you emailed at 16.24 this evening. So not they were a lot hot off the uh, press. So uh, hopefully you're, you're tuning into this. Answer. He says he's got an Oregon 700. He's had it for nearly a year now. It's been problem with it freezing when out in the field. So say so we're not scared to uh, uh, approach these problems. So um, he's actually said later on that he's uh, found some corrupted files on there and uh, some GPX routes and he's, he's, he's deleted those. He's not actually said well to rectify the problem. So if we've got an Oregon GPS unit or any Garmin GPS unit that's freezing, it's usually one of two or three things, isn't yeah. it, really, that we need to work through. Um, and what, what, what would the process be to go, Andy, that you would work yeah. through for there? We always try and look at logical things that'll cause a unit to freeze. I mean, they are mini computers, so, you know, from time to time you may get something happen and we don't get an answer to it. But nine times out of ten, there's a reason why. So if I look at any of the Garmin units, not necessarily just the touchscreen units, the first thing we would always say, treat it like, a, like your computer at home, the software up software updates get me words out from time to time that may fix little bugs or glitches or just add new features so using a program called garmin express which you can download for free you search garmin express on the internet that program will allow you to connect your gps device to the garmin server via garmin express and there's an option there to check for updates so always make sure your gps has got mm. the latest software update i know for the oregon 700 there was an update about a week and a half ago it's now version 3.60. Right. So for the gentleman there with the Oregon 700, make sure it's got the latest software update. That's the first thing we look at. The next most common reason we get for screen freezes on a unit is the type of battery that you're using. A lot of people don't realise in all of the Garmin GPS units, when you go into the option setup and system, so this is if you're not using the, the Garmin battery pack, which is automatically detected by the unit, you've put in your own AA batteries. Until I started this job, I didn't realise how many different voltages there was within uh, batteries out there. So AA batteries, you could have alkaline batteries, lithium batteries, NIMH rechargeable batteries, or this new type of what we call pre-charged rechargeable mm -hmm. batteries that come already charged. In your Garmin unit, if you go into setup and system, and there's an option there for battery type, if you don't change the unit to tell it what type of battery you've got, the unit's looking for potentially a different voltage that can cause a unit to freeze. So it's making sure 
that you've got the right battery setting. And I would always go back to and using good quality batteries, yeah. good brands. I find alkaline batteries aren't great in the touchscreen units. We put it in our data sheets that we send out with the units that we don't recommend alkaline batteries. You should be using really NIMH rechargeables or lithium batteries and making sure you've set the unit for the type of battery. Yeah. So we've done software update, battery yeah, type. Setting. Now a one that gets missed and often customers would never think about in the back of your unit, if you bought it with a micro SD card, map card, if that map card in the back of your unit where your battery sit becomes loose because you've accidentally caught the little clip that holds the map card in place, as you're moving around and that map card's moving around, it can cause the unit to not read the data correctly and freeze the unit up. Our top tip on the micro SD card mm. is take your batteries out the back of the unit where you've got that micro SD card which is worth a lot of money once you know it's locked in place correctly you open it close it make sure it's locked in place a little bit of clear sellotape over the metal clip stops you accidentally catching it when you're changing batteries and that can alleviate problems with freezers because the little clip's being knocked when you were changing batteries and the card's not sitting and in correctly. And that freeze normally comes during boot up, doesn't it? There's yeah. Normally, if it doesn't boot up, because actually as it starts booting up, it now detects the micro SD card, pulls the data off. If there's a connection not right there, it crashes the unit, yeah. doesn't it? I mean, the final one's going to be the corrupt files. If you've been using the unit happily with no freezers, you've suddenly sent a load of roots to it that you might have downloaded from the internet, and then you're getting freezers. You may have a corrupt file from a website, and I would start by using Basecamp software to delete those GPX files and then try again, you know, in case you've got a corrupt file in the unit. Yes, yeah, so yeah, that hopefully. Exa gone. Exactly, it's the same with the data card. Each time the unit switched on, it researches through those GPX files, doesn't it? And if yeah. it finds one that it doesn't it can't like, read, it, it spits the whole lot out. So um, you need to make sure that they're all clean before you put them onto mm -hmm. the device. And where where should we look? So the GPX file is the way our GPS uses to navigate. It's the root data, isn't it? So how do we cause it's how, how do we create corrupt ones? Where do we get these corrupt ones from? How can we? Is there some way we can clean them and check them before we put them in units, or is it just a case of I don't know what's good housekeeping to? to I mean, John, um, Tom might clarify this if I'm going down the right lines. What I find is often it's websites you've done this hundreds of websites out there sharing routes you don't know what software they're being created on you know it could be a garmin a memory map different softwares some people don't realize when they create these routes on a on an online or uh, or mapping software what the maximum number of points is that a garmin will work yeah. to i sometimes download routes from websites and suddenly look at them and think wait there that that's been made of up of three or four hundred points and a garmin gps won't work past 250 points so often it's just unfortunately you yeah. could have a website where the person who's done that route, it's not really compatible with a Garmin. Right. It, it, it's not an easy one to answer, but that, that can no. just be the case. Um, I mean, and, it, and they are just big text files and there's one little thing wrong with it and the whole thing then doesn't work. So my, the way that I've been managing it is, is if you put everything through Basecamp. So the Garmin units are quite open. You can drop them yep. into the GPX folder, can't you? Uh, yep. You know, anything you download straight off the internet. But I find if you put it through Basecamp first, that then tends to iron out some of the, the little corruptions. I mean, our, on, on the GPS online training resource, I've got a video there showing you how you import routes from third-party websites and rather than dropping them straight onto the GPS units internal storage we show you how you import the route into Basecamp first and you can check that it's got the right number of points before you send it to yeah. the unit. And I suppose good housekeeping, I'm just thinking out loud there, is, is it quite good housekeeping is actually take those off your unit so actually don't have a unit bunged in with loads of or GPX files no use that GPS and go for that walk and then transfer it back into Garmin Basecamp and keep your unit fairly clean yeah. Yeah. so actually if it is a corrupt file or there is one if you don't, if you're not doing that, well, it's it's a yeah. way, isn't it? Yeah, really, so keeping that keeping that clean there. Brilliant. So I think we've answered all your questions there. So it seems to have uh, gone. So we're just eight minutes to, and um, I think that's uh, answered all the questions there. So we'll just uh, round up. Uh, very much hope you've enjoyed the first ever uh, GPS training uh, clinic, um, and uh, say something we'll hopefully do as we uh, move on every quarter. So just to finish off with a few things, don't forget to have a look at our website, which is gpstraining.co.uk. And, and on there you'll find lots of information and uh, about the products that we sell, the training courses and also the GPS units.
If you've not already done to uh, subscribe and listen to our uh, GPS Training monthly podcast, again, if you go to our website, which is gpstraining.co.uk, the bottom left of every page, you see a little uh, orange logo, which will take you directly to the podcast. Um, live on Facebook. Um, so again, if, you, if, if you've got friends or people who've missed this, um, again, we're going to upload this onto YouTube or point them in the direction because I know this uh, this 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 um, recording will be on uh, on Facebook for the foreseeable future. And if you bought your GPS from us and you need any support, please just email us. But don't forget to either give us your SW or your GPST reference number. Um, as you appreciate, we can't support over the telephone units that have been bought from us. So again, when you ring up, the first thing we uh, we say is what's your GPST reference or uh, SW, and then we can bring up exactly what unit you got and we can advise you uh, correctly there. And again, often the best way is email because then we can point you in the direction of something on the online resource or, or a fact sheet that uh, we can do that. And talking about the online resource, don't forget our GPS training online resource, which is packed full of videos. Um, and, and then more recently, we've started putting these top tips on there every week. And if you want a GPS for Christmas, um, come have a look at some of the offers we've got. And, um, and we can hopefully help you out. Um, you can either look online, there's some new videos. I know we've got new video reviews online today, uh, ready for Christmas. Um, so you can have a look on that. Again, if you get our newsletter, I'm linking to that in the newsletter tomorrow. So again, we've got some good discounts on the Oregon 700 this Christmas, and all those also the E-Trex Trust 25, and both those come with full GB mapping. Um, I don't know if you guys got anything to add before I have a final goodbye. Um, anything to add, Andy, or are you happy with uh, everything? No, happy. And just remember, you bought a unit from us, use that online training resource that we're now adding every week, the tips from the newsletter. We're doing them as videos, and we're adding them into the online resource, rather than just being a text on a newsletter. It's a nice video you can watch now on the top tips. Brilliant. Tom, do you want to finish off with anything? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Some nice yeah. words. Thank you, Mark. Um, a few of you come on Facebook there saying good evening um, and, and they've enjoyed it. Um, sorry, Les, you missed it. You'll have to catch up on YouTube. You'll catch up on YouTube. Um, Mark says thanks for answering the questions. Um, and I know that was one of the questions that we had, so hopefully we'll cover that subject there. And he's also said good info about the batteries, so uh, thanks for that. So again, um, what we'll do on Facebook, if you want to put any comments on, uh, we'll answer those um, as we come back into work tomorrow. So many, many thanks for logging on tonight. Uh, we're, we have 55 minutes, that's not bad time, is it, for our first one? So we've got five minutes under budget. Have a great evening and thank you very much for logging in. Again, any feedback is everything we do from GPS training. Any feedback, drop us an email, go onto our Facebook page and have a great evening. And many thanks to Andy um, and Tom for joining me uh, this evening for our first ever uh, um, clinic, GPS training clinic. And thanks very much, guys. And have a great evening. Go and get yourself a nice cup of tea or something a little bit stronger you want to. And uh, look forward to the newsletters already. It's going to be going out at 11.45 tomorrow. So the next wave of GPS training will be happening at 11.45. Uh, and hopefully some good stories in there to keep you going over the weekend. So cheers and thank you very much for everyone watching. Thank you. The, uh, thank you. Evening.